So yeah, it's great to see you face to face. So Colin and yeah, I have worked, have worked together for maybe uh, 10 years or more, I think off and on. Uh, and he yeah. uh, started out with the what, Small Business Development Center and moved on since then. So Colin, do you want to introduce yourself or tell, tell us a little bit about yourself and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah. We'll <laughs> hey everybody. Um, so my name's Colin Bunch, like Scott said. Uh, right now, I work for Venture Partners out in CU Boulder. So I live in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I moved out here, what, October or so uh, from Missouri. Um, and I work, we basically help some of the leading scientists and engineers in the world. Uh, you know, if they invent something, develop something, we help them turn it into a startup. Uh, sometimes they can license it to a big company, uh, commercialize it that way. But even if that's the case anymore, they basically have to start a company de-risk it considerably to get it to a product before someone like Lockheed Martin or whoever would be interested in just taking it. Um, they, want, they want to know both that it has a use, someone will pay for it, and that it's feasible as a product, not feasible as an experiment in your lab. Um, so I, we do that through education. Um, you can imagine, I don't know if any of you had professors who are way too into their stuff, but uh, everyone here is, you know, really, really smart at whatever they do, photons, measuring, you know, rays, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then all of a sudden, they're getting into this whole world of starting a business, and they're not good at any of it. And usually the first thing they find out is whatever they developed isn't as cool as they thought, or no one really cares what the way it is now. So it's like, you know, you spent 10 years researching this widget, and you finally got it, and then you take it out, and everyone's like, yeah, it's, that's cool, but I don't really want it. Um, so helping them reorient to probably there is a problem that your technology solves, but it isn't whatever you thought when you started. You know, how do you talk to other humans? How do you figure out something that is enough of a pain that they'll pay money for um, and then go from there? So we do that through, you know, short workshops, classes. Um, we try to be engaging like Scott, uh, not necessarily lectures. Um, and then some specific things like uh, research to market and other things that are based on kind of a sprint of customer discovery. So give them some training, let them practice, go interview 10 people, see how you did, what did you learn? Do that again a few times. Um, we do that with a lot of support and mentors. Um, so if you think of someone like me and then someone who's had multiple successful companies and every time you get stuck, you can go call on us and it kind of accelerates that. So they might've taken 10 years to get to here and then we're trying to really speed them up to kind of, you know, work with the business community or the entrepreneurial community. Um, the speed at which startups move is much faster than a, you know, academic institution. Prior to that, uh, so until recently, I worked for uh, Ready in Columbia, Missouri. They're a private public, private public partnership in Columbia. Um, so they work on economic development. They also, uh, we took control. We, the airport was under Ready. So before that, it was ran by transportation in Columbia, which is the same people who do the bus system, um, to give you some perspective. And we saw how it was limiting the growth of the community. Um, Aurora Organic Dairy, one of the big employers out in Columbia now, that's from Boulder, actually, that moved out there, is the biggest organic dairy in the country. And the only reason they chose Columbia, or they wouldn't have crossed this off, is that they could get from Denver to Columbia pretty quickly. Um, and so some of those things that weren't in place, I think when I started, when I moved to Columbia, Scott, it was the airport only went to Memphis right. like once a day. And like no one, you know, I don't know how many of you all fly to Memphis regularly, but it is not a hub for a lot of other stuff. Well, it was, it was me was the main one. And then I would go to, the, to Atlanta from there. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, you weren't going to Memphis. Right. Um, yeah. So how, how much of an impact just being able to go to Dallas, uh, where else we go? Denver, Chicago, yeah, really changed Huge. Columbia. Yeah, yeah. Just having those things as potential. Um, so all that stuff is matter. You know, matters a lot. It wouldn't matter if we had the you know all the coolest startups in the world. If no one could get to Columbia without taking five flights, no one is coming. Um, so those things are really important. Like the rules of the game you're even playing. Uh, so in that role, uh, uh, counseled a lot of startups. We have a hub downtown. Um, we also had a lot of events. Everything from one million cups. That is like national nationwide. One or two startups present every week. 
Um, and we got into hackathons, game jams, lots of things to draw out and connect people. And then they would start, you know, new ventures off of it. So it wasn't a direct, uh, you know, kind of incentive thing that some cities do. And then prior to that, I worked for the Small Business Development Center through Mizzou. So we would help people start and grow businesses. Uh, everything from, I had a 14-year-old lady who had a softball product up through uh, high growth companies, uh, you know, doing manufacturing, exporting stuff with a couple hundred employees um, and selling overseas. Um, we would you know, basically sit down across from them, help them through stuff, help them with market research, uh, you know, getting financials together to get a loan or investment, all those things. Um, and so through about... 10, 11 years, I've probably worked, you know, sitting across the table with over a thousand entrepreneurs um, or I could recall most of them. My first business was as a student, as an undergrad at UCM in Warrensburg. Uh, it was a social venture called Chairs That Care. So we developed these camping chairs that had our logo and all that stuff on them. And then we sold that and all of our profits went to help uh, the women's shelter in Warrensburg um, and did really well at that, had a good team. Um, we ended up making like 20,000 net profit in just four or five months. And you and also, that, and if you can interrupt for a little bit, one of the yeah. things uh, uh, we've mentioned a little bit in this class is doing things that don't scale and also um, getting out there and selling before you even have a product. Uh, and that was one of those things that you did early on, right? You found that you could sell the chair without ever having a chair. Yeah. But yeah. This is before Lean Startup was a thing. And we had this timeline where the school would get us in front of banks to get money to get your products. And we just didn't want to wait for the school timeline, right? So we designed the chair and publisher and we went around and sold them on like my terrible picture to faculty, teachers, some students, some parents. And we got enough. We sold about $2,000 worth um, and convinced this manufacturer in Connecticut that we were totally a real company and we had all this money and they should give us $10,000 worth of chairs. And they did it. <laughs> Um, so then we can start selling through them. So we really like create, you know, that's what I love about startups is like you're creating this whole thing out of nothing. Um, and we have this debate all the time. I work with a lot of academics who study everything. And, you know, it's like, is a startup, is a company, is it really a social construct? You basically convince all these other people that this thing is real long enough and then it becomes real at some point. But it's really like this collective delusion that you can spread for a while. Um, and that's kind of what we did. And then, be, you know, then we got the chairs and we could start really selling them and everything worked from there. Well, if you, in a, uh, students, if you remember, at least I remember when I was a small kid, uh, that old story about stone soup, right? So uh, yeah. revolutionary soldiers come into the, um, he's gone off skiing, I guess. A revolutionary soldiers uh, go off <laughs> and uh, they want to uh, make some soup in the town and they they put some stones in that and they say, oh, all it needs is a pinch of salt and all it needs is a little bit of this. And it's kind of kind of that uh, whole effort, right? So you're, you're building the stone soup and um, you're relying on those other people's uh, other people in the community to, to help you build that. Um, neat. Well, how do you um, speaking? We have a big tech transfer office here, right? And we have this idea that we're going to take um, our scientists' inventions and we're going to turn them into multi-billion dollar products and, and uh, make lots of royalties off of that and they'll, they'll be successful as well. Um, but we also talked in this class about the idea that you should not have an idea, build it and brand it and then go to the customer. You should go to the customer first, which is a lot of what you talked about. How do you intercept academics? So they don't spend 10 years doing all this research. Uh, is there a way to intervene earlier to um, you know, get them thinking about this, get them talking to customers before they actually have a, a solution? Yeah, I mean, so we, th we think about this all the time. Um, one thing that we've seen is company like scientists that are starting to work on like SBIR grants, small business innovation research. So every federal agency has to set aside 2% of their budget to, to those grants. So DOD, NASA, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and a lot of scientists will get those just as a way to get more research money around a specific thing but it's really supposed to be about productizing something. It's about getting into the world. So we found that we engage anyone who's getting those and there's, there's 25,000 that's supposed to be for commercialization. And sometimes they don't even know how to use, this is insane, but they don't know how to use it or they'll just spend it all on like some conference or something, right? Just blow it all on one day, some event versus like, 
you know, if I offered one of you or two or three of you 25,000 to run down this tech for three months and see who wants it, you could probably go a long way, right? Like paying your bills, you could fly, whatever. Um, so we're looking at that, getting a lot more grad students and just students in general in, involved with those folks, um, getting grad students from their labs, so who work with them. A lot of folks who want to go into academia or research or science, I mean, you basically have to wait for someone to pass away, right? So there's not, you know, it's like getting into the NBA almost. Like, you know, a lot of people play basketball, only like 30 people a year are going to make it in, right? Um, so this is giving, giving a lot of grad students, scientists, engineers a different pathway. You can get this funding that's non-dilutive, that's for this company, and basically launch it. You have the support of your researcher or scientist, um, but you can take it and, and go on your own. Um, the other thing that we're doing right now is uh, it's like a mentor accelerator. So we have a lot of people, you know, who help or who meet with folks that have had, you know, success in the past. And so we're looking at if we can, you know, prove there's something there and give you some kind of small stipend. So not what you're worth, but 2000 a month or something. Would you take this to like the first sale, basically? Would you prove that there really is something? Um, we see that somewhere a lot of scientists will do the customer discovery and then they figure something out and they're like, okay, back to the lab, you know, let's just do some more research. It's like, no, you just figured it out how to make money that someone wants this. Now, now the um, step is to actually make the money. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's crazy. It's uh, so I, I think the bigger, you know, thing is a cultural change. So getting, getting, you know, more grad students to have those experiences. So they get it. Um, I think a lot of the agencies and even some of the funding organizations are pushing more, you know, it's not about startups for them. It's about, we want this to matter, right? Like I remember someone at Mizzou developed, you know, gold nanoparticles to attack cancer and then they filed it away for a while. And it was like, no, you know, people need that right now. If that's true, you know, right. um, so it's really about getting things out into the world. And that seems to land more, you know, than even, than even like you could make a bunch of money. It's like, don't you want your stuff to matter, right? You know, actually, um, yeah. And, and money um, is interesting because uh, the way that we view money, right? So, um, uh, one of our guest speakers on Tuesday talked about money as a proof of work of any type of money, whether it's, it's something like Bitcoin, where we talk about proof of work, whether it's something like. Uh, you know, the money I receive from the university is proof of my work, right? So I've done some some amount of work to, to get that. Um, and uh, it's interesting the way we kind of view money and a lot of people, you know, that do want to change the world view money as some sort of, uh, um, you know, if you're making money, that's not right. Well, money enables you to affect change in the world. And, and so uh, yeah. that idea of a social enterprise is becoming more and more common. I know we have an event coming up. Um, I've gotten some details from Annette Kendall, which is going to be around this whole idea of developing social enterprises. So enterprises that make money, but also benefit people at the same time. The, um, yeah. Um, and I would say too, and in, uh, in Tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like there's a lot more money that communities are putting into startups in the last year um, because of uh, you know COVID and other things. Seeing this as a way to kind of jumpstart the economy, yeah. with new ideas. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if you look at like the data over enough time, the the stats on large corporations creating any jobs are are pretty bad. Um, so most net new jobs, so like. When, when Missouri gave Applebee's 90 million to move their headquarters from Kansas City, Kansas to Kansas City, Missouri, zero new jobs are created, right? Maybe like a janitor got hired or something. Um, and it just moved them over. And most of the people didn't even move because it was like an extra five minute drive. So it didn't do anything. Um, and that's how a lot of governments think and drive things. Um, versus like a startup, uh, Beyond Meat actually is a tech transfer startup from Mizzou. I don't know if any of you know Beyond Meat, but um, they're, they're still most of the manufacturing is in, is in Columbia. All of those jobs that were created with them are brand new. Um, they basically took venture money from a bunch of overly wealthy people and then created this, you know, right, right? Originally, it was, just, it was just lab science. It was like, hey, we can make this pea protein actually taste and feel like chicken. That was it, right? Now there's a whole bunch of stuff around it. And they have a company and they have, you know, mid-level managers and their own Michael Scotts and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> And, and they're, you know, and that's changed the Columbia economy. They have a hundred or so high paid people. Yeah, 
They're there. Um, I actually helped a buddy of mine that over the Christmas break that was installing equipment out there, and we went out oh, to yeah. Limon Industrial Drive as well as to uh, on off of Vandiver. They have a big uh, uh, plants there, and yeah. of course they're actually now in California. They're publicly listed on the New York Stock Exchange, so mm -hmm. kind of a big deal. Um, we have a, yeah, they're not a startup anymore. Right, they're not a startup. Uh, a startup is like fundamentally means they don't they don't know what the business model is yet they you know have some things figured out right so um we had a student in this class a year ago uh ed gee uh and he uh, developed this company within the last year called stratodyne along with a couple other uh, mizzou students and uh, they have this uh, technology where they basically have like a balloon with a, a drone underneath it okay or connected to it and they can fly up to you know um, the edge of space and basically sit up there for months on end. They're above the jet stream, mm -hmm. you know, they can do all their surveillance. So it's been very interesting because he's continued to have to pivot to find the right application for it, right? And so uh, now he's really working with uh, things in agriculture. Well, he was, he was able to get $50,000 from the ARCH grants in St. Louis. He then, um, St. Louis, some of you from that area, Abe, maybe you're aware of this, but uh, Abe, it's becoming the geospatial center. Um, there's a big uh, national laboratory that's moved there. And so they're geospatial. How do you measure things in geography? And so he just got, a, he texted me about two nights ago and said he got $100,000 uh, of grant funding from them to uh, develop his technology. And Colin used a word that I'm gonna use again here and explain what it is, it's non-dilutional. What does that mean? Well, it means if uh, Ed owns, Ed and those three uh, Trulask College of Business students own that business, when I put $100,000 in and it's non-dilutional, it means that I don't get ownership. They don't give up some of their ownership. Whereas if I'm a venture capitalist or an angel investor, I might say, hey, you know, Colin, I'll, I'll give you $100,000, but I want 5% right of that business that's valued at 10 million or whatever you know a million dollars or whatever um so that's what the, the idea is to kind of stave off that dilution right so because uh, otherwise you can end up being a minority owner <laughs> and <laughs> getting kicked out of your own business <laughs> yeah a, a great example of doing that well is zapier is another they're from columbia they're a startup they they took only one investment with y combinator of like a million a million and a half um, and last I checked, they're valued at over a billion. They have like a 40 or 50 million year revenue stream, um, really lean. They basically own the company. It's like Wade and all these people who they started at Startup Weekend in Columbia yeah. um, because yeah. they bootstrapped it and structured it right, didn't give away their company. Yeah. And once again, that was a, a, an area where they, yeah, you don't always have to take uh, uh, outside fund, and you can bootstrap it, as we say, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. But that was another um, interesting area where they took something that was such a pain. Basically, I have this program here, I have data in it or an action that happens here. Someone signs up for my mailing list. I have a CRM system here, which is what my salespeople use to follow up to call people, and they can't connect. Okay, and so they basically make this little thing that you make these zaps that connect all that and say, okay, when you sign up for this mailing list, let's then put it over in our CRM software and Salesforce and put a, a to do for Abe to go ahead and call this person next Tuesday. And let's make sure that uh, he follows up and, and then we'll know what's going on. And, you know, uh, that was the sort of thing that um, you talk to business owners that were having that trouble and they're just like, take my money, you know? <laughs> yeah. I had a hospital that had three people whose whole job was to transfer information between systems. You know, like it was all there already in a computer. Um, and some of you, like the internet's been kind of like working since you've been maybe grown up enough, but like it used to be, you know, lots of time just fighting um, yeah. bad systems. Yeah. Copy and paste, cleaning up data, import, exports. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, so Colin, you've uh, developed a little thing. Uh, I don't know if we'll play it in this class eventually or not, but we have played it in classes called Domain Purge. Tell us about, about that. What is the kind of exercise that you've done and developed for people to learn about this? some of the ideas we've been talking about? 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of research on, you know, experiences or doing an activity. Um, one of the things we saw, and I mentioned it earlier, we have faculty that do a lot of work and get almost about to start and they even figure out what they need to do and then they still don't for some reason, right? Um, and the same thing, we would see a lot of folks who are interested in a company or whatever, would put it off for a long time. The thing that I know and a lot of people that work with entrepreneurs know is like, it doesn't matter. Like your first idea is terrible. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would say 100% of the people I've worked with, you know, hasn't been right or, you know, they have to tweak something or have a big pivot. So you wait six months or a year to start and then it was wrong anyway and you've wasted all that time. So we thought, what is the quickest way we could just get someone through this? Um, so are they, the activity is called Domain Purge. We use unused domains, either ones that we own or on a, shot, on a site like Fresh Drop. So ones that just expired get into small teams of three or four, you get assigned a domain, and then you basically have an hour to launch a business with a website, a landing page, a video, and some way to take what we call currency, which could be a meeting or email or money. Um, some way that they like indicate that they like it more than just saying, I like it. Um, and by, by designing it so that there's very limited time, right? Uh, everything's sort of a game. If you think about like happy hour is a game, right? You show up between four and six, you get half off drinks. It's that easy to win. Uh, so that time dynamic is really crucial, you know, in a lot of games. So only giving them an hour means you have to get it done in an hour. Um, most people will procrastinate or make something perfect or try to. We've already, you know, one of the first ones was dailycatfacts.com, right? Like it doesn't matter whatever you're going to do on the first try. It's probably, it's probably not going to be right. So you just need to get something out there to test it. And the whole idea is, to shorten your learning cycles. Um, and then that's something that you can apply to a lot of stuff. Everything from like recruiting and what language you use and where you push it into like, what do I say on Instagram or Facebook specifically that will get someone to at least check me out or sign up. Um, and the quicker you can do that as a startup, uh, the faster you can get to something that's you know manageable. And that's also your biggest advantage over like existing companies. And so that's uh, figuring out which ads are going to work best or which questions or how do you get to your customer. Uh, that falls under kind of a bigger umbrella of what we call business experiments. So some of it is simple, what we call A-B testing, um, basically because uh, you might have, uh, well, here's one version of my message and here's another version, but it can be multivariant. You can have 10 different versions of your of your message and so that's a big part of um business today i would say and, and you all uh, everybody in this class has been subject uh, a subject in an experiment okay you don't realize it but when you go to a website what they will do is they will actually have different variants of that website it may be subtle it may be something like the button up here is green and it's up higher where you click apply and it's down here at the bottom on the right and it's red and colin gets one version of that i get another and they test basically by sorting people into these different buckets if you will and finding out which is the most effective. So if you go to a place like um, Veterans United, uh, their website, very effective at converting people from, you know, just thinking about stuff to actually using their service. Well, that's um, a place that uh, uh, uses this type of testing all the time. Is, is Marlo there? <laughs> no, that's why she's really quiet. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Marlo's is Colin's um, daughter who um, really likes to be on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, she hasn't found this yet. Um, you know, I would say, you know, whatever career you're going into, if you can think of how to meaningfully test something and make a decision, it will help you a lot. No, right. No. Let me, um, I... And Colin, I was only going to occupy you for about a half an hour or so. Let me, um, let me, I have a couple of questions from students that I wanted to ask. Um, so we have one student that um, saw that you moved to Denver. Um, this student is planning to pursue a career in international business. Um, how has the move uh, changed you, your career, uh, your outlook, perhaps on things? Uh, has been in a different location mattered? Yeah, you know, the short answer is yes. I think for me, 
Uh, there's lots a lot of there's a lot of great quotes, but luck is somewhat uh, you know a symptom of your environment and how many shots you take. Mm -hmm. uh, so, a, a really simple example is my wife right now. We're looking at buying a historic inn in the mountains that she found. It's undervalued. The people ran into the ground, and in going and talking to people, if we explain like how it's undervalued, what the market is here for weddings and events they will get it in that meeting and offer to invest in us. That would take three or four months in Missouri. You know what I mean? Like, so the, some of it is like people have done that and been successful. Some of it is that there's just a, a lot broader understanding of entrepreneurship and startups and things. Um, there's also a bigger density. I think a lot about if St. Louis was 20 minutes away from Columbia, that's kind of the dynamic for Boulder and Denver. Um, so you have, you know, Boulder has tons of labs, really small, smart people. And then it's only, you know, 20, 30 minutes from a huge metro. So that, that interplay is big. Yeah, I would say that a lot of um, people give career advice of getting to a big city uh, just because there is more, there's more luck, if you will. Um, it's not to ding living in rural areas. Uh, I lived, grew up in a rural area and loved it, but um, there's just more opportunity in some ways. Yeah, and I think you have to drive it. Like, you, like I, we have friends that just moved to Denver and then like he's working at a pizza shop now, like, which is fine, but you know, that, that isn't why they moved here. Um, so like you have to still like seek out things and make things happen. Um, and then, uh, you know, really love Columbia. One of the things that's nice about Columbia, uh, is the community, is the small town feel, even for the size that it is. Um, and one, one uh, disadvantage slash advantage I see is there's not a ton of capital there. But because of that, um, we had a lot less companies that didn't have anything. You know, when there's enough money around, sometimes you can get money for like a bad idea or something that's not proven. Um, you know, most of the stuff we worked on in Columbia had a need because there, there wasn't time or money to make a fake you know, a bad idea, basically. Um, right. And then I would say with the pandemic, that has really finally broken down a lot of the silos for investment and stuff from Silicon Valley, um, where they're really looking globally and you can make things happen anywhere. Yeah. What would you say uh, as far as students that have an idea for a startup, what resources are there at Mizzou or, or um, Columbia or even nationally for getting uh, started? Yeah, so it kind of depends on what it is, but I would get with, uh, in, in Columbia or in Missouri, get with the Small Business Development Center. Um, those are in every state, actually. Their, their skill levels vary, but Missouri's is really strong. Um, it's a free resource. They're funded by the SBA. They're also connectors to a lot of other things. So you'll get a counselor, someone like that, that was my job, who will sit with you, talk with you one-on-one, -on -one, you know, ask you the right questions. And then also connect you to other resources in the state or country. Um, Million Cups I mentioned earlier, is, it was started by Kaufman out of Kansas City. It's now in maybe like 140 cities or more, but it's all over the nation, you know, Puerto Rico, a couple other places. That's a weekly gathering of entrepreneurs. Right now, most of them are on Zoom. Some of them are getting back in person, but each, uh, each week, one or two companies present for six minutes. They explain their business model and then the audience, so like you, ask questions, give feedback. Uh, it is some of the best learning. Uh, I always learn something every week. I went for seven years in Columbia. We started it there. Um, and it's still continuing. You know, so every Wednesday at nine, if you just search yep. one million cups, Columbia, Missouri, it's been a couple of weeks since I've been, but like the last guy I saw present uh, basically has this woodworking shop and he says it's like a gym for woodworkers. So you don't want to have to have your own table saw and your own, uh, you know, other yeah. lathe or whatever it is, or you don't have the space for it. Well, you just buy like a gym membership. Okay. You, you have to still pay for your own wood, but then you can come in and they have just like a gym classes to help you, you know, learn what you're doing there. So very interesting ideas. Um, some of them are small scale. So there's some businesses that just want to have, you know, a nice little business because they want to work for themselves. And so not every startup is going to be, uh, you know, the next equipment share or next Beyond Meat or something like that. And you don't have to be, right? So you can, you know, my business was not really a startup, but it was, uh, you know, I was happy doing it. So uh, that, was the, that was the main goal. <laughs> yeah, I would say, uh, like for my kids, for a lot of my interns, I require them to start some kind of a business. 
because I mean, you just saw with the pandemic, right? Like, no, there's no career path that is safe or like stable, right? The other thing is that I've had a job that I did not like and I was able to quit because they had a side business that I knew I could sit, you know, sit on until my next thing come. And there is a lot of power in that. And you can go into historical and like, you know, England and all that stuff, um, the rise of the merchant class, but just like you as an individual, you know, being like, this is toxic. I don't need this. I'm going to just do my own thing, um, you know, is a lot. So I, I had a consulting business on the side that I knew I could scale up if I wanted to, to be enough to keep me going. Um, so finding things like that. I also think it, it you know, if you, even if you do, um, it's called, uh, somebody was asking the name of that a company. It's called Sawdust Studios. Okay, so that's the name of the, uh, um, yeah, community uh, wood shop for 24 seven. So you can go in there at 2 a.m., hopefully not after going to Harpo's uh, and uh, start to do your woodworking. Um, so kind of an interesting model. And you often see that too, the people taking kind of traditional businesses and turning uh, new models, right? So they're new combinations of things. And, um, and then some of these are even like coffee companies. So they're, you know, how am I gonna be a different type of coffee company? And you also have derivatives like Master Tech Plumbing here in Columbia developed a billing and uh, customer tracking software that they now sell to other companies. Uh, and uh, I think it was what the Room 38 guys made a uh, mm -hmm. software that staffed up, staffed up uh, so they have a startup that actually helps uh, restaurants uh, staff themselves, right? So it's kind of a lot of creativity here. Um, so I would highly recommend checking that out, all these networking events. And there are a huge number of just free resources. So Colin was talking about SBA. Well, um, Jay Sparks, who'll be in the next class, will, he's kind of the, the, we don't call him the new Colin any, anymore because we're trying to be nice to him. So, but, That's tough. <laughs> But he, uh, um, you know, is doing a good job and he consults people. There's a hub down there where it's just kind of like, um, how would you say, oh, our version of startup space. Uh, yeah, it's a collaborative co-working space. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, you I think that's a good example too. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, so that position, uh, I work with the city to create brand new uh, and similar to the one I'm in now. So like when I was in school, none of the entrepreneurs stuff ever even existed you know I'm like not only have I like made my own career I've made two or three of my own jobs where I'm like hey you have to pay me this much this is what I'll do this is what we need this is how I know we need it um you know and getting that approved by Columbia City Council is is one of my biggest accomplishments um, you, you all don't know about the politics in Columbia which is good but yeah just well and it's, there's lots of, uh, so the hub is, I think you can get free access to that if you have meet certain requirements. So if you have a student idea, you can get a co-working space. And what the neat thing about that is, even in the pandemic, is that you are around other entrepreneurs that are doing the same thing. Okay, so you learn from each other. So um, that's, uh, I think, been kind of the key to the success of the businesses down there is not the space itself, but it's the uh, networking that goes on while you're down there working. And, and there's a change of mindset. So I used to go down there sometimes and um, just work because then I could be in a different venue, right? And you get different sparks, different ideas. But there's also other ones like SCORE, which is uh, kind of older executives that advise people. So let's say you build your business, you now got 30 employees and like, oh, shoot, things are getting complicated, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, now I'm going to have to buy a building or rent or do something else or make these other decisions. There's kind of people that'll help you at different levels along the, along the way here in Columbia. So, um, you know, the lack of capital is an issue, but I think Columbia is very good as far as... Uh, the number of uh, people that are willing to help each other. So, but, um, well, Colin, we play this game uh, with our faculty. Do you want to be rich or do you want to be a king? And basically, like, if you want to be rich, you have to like give up control, get as much help as you can. It, like, you don't own the thing anymore. You're still going to get the money, right? But if you want to be the person who controls everything about it and it's exactly your dream and your vision, like, you'll be the king of nothing, but you'll be a king. Um, right. And it's, it's almost like a law of physics. Like it just plays out so often. 
you know, there's something behind that. Right. Well, very good. Well, um, any advice to our students? Uh, any advice to your, uh, I don't know what, 20 yeah, I think, uh, younger self or college level self? Yeah, I think I would look to make more aggressive mistakes. I would reach out to people that have money, even if I don't know how I can help them. Um, you'll be amazed at how many people just need someone who has like a decent halfway logical brain, some energy and passion, and is, ability, is, is willing to learn things. Um, you know, the world's changing really quickly. So like, you're not any farther behind than I am on what's coming tomorrow, right? Like in some ways you're better prepared. So don't undercount that part of your background, even if you don't have 10 years of experience or blah, blah, blah. Um, and just be more aggressive than you think, I guess. Excellent. Excellent advice. Well, Colin, thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward and to seeing you maybe in the fall. Maybe I'll make a quick trip out that way and um, let me know if there's anything I can do to help you. Awesome. Nice all to right. meet you all. Good luck on everything.